What's up? What's up? I'm Dr. Omatma, host of Egg Meat Sperm, where we're busting fertility myths, sharing tangible tips for your fertility journey, and bringing you the most knowledgeable guests to support your journey to parenthood. This podcast is for both women and men because getting fertile as fuck is for both partners, don't you think? Remember, just listening to this podcast won't get you pregnant, but following the tips we share just may. Let's get you fertile AF so that you can co-create the family you dream of. And if your partner's not listening to this, make sure to share this episode with your partner. Hello and welcome to Egg Meat Sperm. My guest today is Amy Raup. She is renowned in women's health and fertility. I am almost pinching myself that she has agreed to be on the podcast today. I'm really excited to be talking to her about egg and sperm health, which we are going to dive into, but a little bit about her so you know what a badass she is. Um, She is renowned as the women's health and fertility detective, celebrity acupuncturist and coach, and the best-selling author of books, Chill Out and Get Healthy in 2009, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant in 2014, Body Belief in 2018, and the latest, The Egg Quality Diet in 2021. As a fertility detective with two decades of experience, Amy works virtually with clients all over the world, as well as she is a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist in private practice in New York and Connecticut. Amy holds a master's degree in traditional oriental medicine and a bachelor's degree in biology from Rutgers University, also my alma mater. (laughs) Uh, She is the founder of Amy Rout Beauty Line of handcrafted organic skincare products that are optimized for hormone harmony. All in all, like she's been on interviews, TV, podcasts, She is endorsed by Deepak Chopra, Ariana Huffington, Gabriella Bernstein. Like, oh my gosh, this woman is a total badass. And I am so excited to talk to you today about egg and sperm health because those are just so important when it comes to fertility. So, hi. Hi, Hi. Amy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm um, honored to be with a fellow badass. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah, egg and sperm health. I mean, it's where it's at, right? Yeah. It's, uh, and I think what most people maybe, I don't want to say don't understand, maybe that's not the right word, but most people aren't educated on the fact that you can improve both egg health and sperm health, even as you get chronologically older. Mm -hmm. And so that has been my main mission in the work that I do over these two decades. Um, and have gotten really clear on the fact that we can be getting chronologically older and biologically and cellularly healthier and remembering that the eggs and the sperm are from cells in our body. And so everything we do with the choices we make directly impact the quality and the health of that egg and those sperm. And that we have so much power here and that age isn't our only, you know, uh, downfall, if you will, whereas it Mm -hmm. always just seems like, oh, well, it's age related, age related, Mm -hmm. age related. It's like, no, no. Yeah, I can have a 45 year old with healthier eggs or sperm than a 25 year old, you know, depending on their quality of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what's interesting is I've heard lots of doctors say to their patients that egg health cannot be impacted by diet and lifestyle. Can you speak to that for a second? Because God, well, like, I, think I just too, want to what be really like, ups- who is this doctor? Well, that's like- it. What upsets me the most is that if you're going to have an opinion and you're going to share it with your client, then you should be reading the research, you know, at the minimum, especially from a medical doctor's perspective, there is a ton of research showing, you know, even simple things like antioxidant therapy is helping improve quality of eggs, right? We're seeing melatonin is doing that. We see myo-inositol is doing that. 
We're seeing vitamin D is improving implantation. Vitamin D levels are directly correlated with poor egg health and poor sperm health. So like, mm -hmm. even if you don't want to say diet, you could at the minimum be like, well, but you should focus on these things because you get them through your diet, right? Antioxidants, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do. But it's upsetting because uh, there is plenty of nutrition research out there um, showing that you know, I think two things. I think there's, I shouldn't just say nutrition. There's plenty of research out there showing two things. One, that environmental toxins like chemicals and pesticides in our foods and our environment are directly negatively impacting our fertility. And two, that an antioxidant rich diet, a nutrient dense diet full of certain nutrients like choline or D or and, uh, amino acids are positively impacting egg and sperm health. So you know, I think if you had a doctor that said that, what, you know, some of my patients do or all clients do, and I'll tell them either, you know, here's some research that you can share with your physician. Some of them are very open and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. Or just realize, I also say to my girls, a lot of times I say, you know, you're not going to come to me for an egg retrieval, right? Because that's not what I went to school for. I'm not trained to be a reproductive endocrinologist. So just like you wouldn't come to me for an egg retrieval, don't go to them for nutrition advice because it's just not their area of expertise. It's not where they spend their time. It's not their clinical focus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Separate it absolutely. out. It's almost like you need this for that and that for this. And, um, but you can't, you just can't deny the research. And then I think as clinicians, right, we see it so clear cut that as we work on improving health on all the levels, we see fertility outcomes improve. And even now, I mean, the other thing too, of like, it's been decades where either FSH was the lead and AMH was is now the lead of these determine your, your, they're predictors of your fertility. Um, a lot of doctors will even say they're predictors of egg quality, like if FSH is high or AMH is low. And now there was just a fairly large study that came out last month um, in the journal Fertility and Sterility, completely, uh, you know, knocking that, if you will, saying actually women with low AMH in comparison to women with high AMH or normal AMH of the same age, same race, same BMI are having the same pregnancy outcomes mm -hmm. within you know, it was actually up to three years of trying to conceive. So I, I think like just using that as an example of the data is always changing. The information is always changing. And so you really do be want to be working with clinicians, physicians, doctors, whatever you want to call them, practitioners that are up to date on the research. And that are also, I think, thinking outside the box because the standard approach to fertility is, is archaic in mm -hmm. this country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So I want to get, let's, let's dive into egg health. Cause that's where we're at. Um, mm -hmm. what are, I know you listed some supplements that help with egg health or nutrition nutrients, which you can yeah. also get from food that help with egg health. Um, what do you think are the biggest drivers that make a, a difference, like make it or break it in terms of egg quality? Fat good quality fats. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the outer shell of the egg, right. Is a phospholipid bilayer. You and mm -hmm. I know that from our studies, um, which basically means it's fat on the outside. And I don't know how I work very visually, but like what I see poor egg quality being is it's, it's a fragile kind of decrepit shriveled up egg. Right. And so what we want to do is really, I always say, juice it up. We want to mm -hmm. make them juicy and plump and then that's, you know, they're just going to divide better when they're fertilized. And that means chromosomal normalcy, right? right. Um, a euploid embryo, right? So fat, good quality fats, you know, mm -hmm. things like avocado, olive oil, coconut oil, ghee, grass-fed butter, if you tolerate dairy well, um, you know, nuts and seeds, if you can tolerate those well, eggs, good quality meat, you know, and again, like, that all has room in a healthy fertility diet. I don't think any foods should necessarily be completely cut out unless your body has a very strong reaction to them. But you really want to think about fat. And, and the research, and I talk about this in my latest book, Egg Quality Diet, um, the research does show that a, a diet consistent of about 40 to even 50% fat as your macronutrient levels really does have an impact on egg quality, if you will, like when we were looking at women undergoing IVF, who, who had better eggs, who got, you know, who got more embryos, who got more blasts was mm -hmm. when they, they had a macronutrient profile of about 40 to 45% fat, 
um, 25, 30% protein, and then the rest carbohydrates. So still in that like 20% range for carbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot of fat. Yeah. It's a lot of fat. What does that break down to in real life? In real life. So I just, this is how I always, when I go over, I go over food diaries, like, you know, uh, a lot, uh, (laughs) a lot in my whole team, we all, food diaries are like where it's at for us because I really get to see what people are doing and how they're doing it. And so my general, like when I look at a food diary, what I'm looking for is I want to see good quality protein and two to three servings of vegetables with every meal, three of those a day. And so good quality protein could be eggs. It could be salmon. It could be, um, you know, I had some actually chicken meatballs that I made using mushroom as a binder last night. That's what I had for kind of my breakfast this morning. Um, and then a, a good heaping side of, of Brussels sprouts. And so, you know, quickly looking at a, a good quality protein that comes from, you know, a grass fed pastured animal or wild caught fish. And and obviously there's some farm raised fishes that are actually fine for us too. I always recommend looking at um, seafood watch for kind of what's good in your area and what Mm -hmm. kind of fish, but um, you know, that that's about, about three ounces. So the size of your palm, three to four ounces in your meal, and then two to three servings of vegetables, which is about a cup and a half, two cups of vegetables cooked, right? Half a cup cooked is one serving, right? Is that how I always um, get it screwed up? Then and the vegetables cooked typically in a good healthy fat like olive oil, like avocado oil, like ghee, like coconut oil, um, or they could be steamed and then drizzled with a little bit of olive oil or something of that nature. And so I'm looking for that about three times a day. So three ounces, three times a day of a good nutrient dense protein, good quality protein, and then six to eight servings of vegetables cooked over raw. You could still do some raw. I kind of uh, apply an 80, 20 rule. Um, but even if it's raw, I would want it, you know, if, like I'll do arugula, I love arugula with like smoked salmon. And so I'll, I'll like massage the arugula with olive oil, mm-hmm. a little bit of salt, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like break it down a little bit or yeah. kale really finely cut kale with, with your uh, olive oil as well. So that the greens or the vegetable that is raw also has this good quality fat on it. And then I want to see, um, that we're not going longer than three hours between some kind of meal or snack. So say we're eating our breakfast at, you know, 8 a.m. and maybe it's two eggs and a, and a heaping side of vegetables, some avocado. And then, you know, at about 11, maybe there's a little bit of a snack. It could be a little bit of nut butter or some fruit with nut butter, something of that nature. Um, If you do beans well, a little hummus and carrots or something like that. And then your lunch, maybe around one, again, three to four ounces of protein with about two servings of veg then another little snack and then your dinner, same thing. Um, And that's typically what I look for. That's typically where I see the, the changes happening. What I typically see when someone comes to me is, Oh, I'm doing all the things, you know, I read your book. Yes, you can get pregnant or I read the egg quality diet. So I'm completely gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, all the things free, which, Mm -hmm. you know, listen, I would say in all honesty, 80% of my clients need to be free of all those things. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does, but at the minimum, they should be really good quality if you're eating them or sprouted. Um, But they're not eating enough protein. I, I mean, I had a girl yesterday, she goes about six hours between meals. And I was like, it's crashing your blood sugar. And it puts your body really, I mean, I think from a very basic perspective, it tells your body like I'm in survival mode. And so I'm choosing to just get by. I'm not choosing to thrive and reproduce. And they're, they're two different pathways. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. when, when you um, very thoughtfully and consistently feed your body good quality nutrient dense foods throughout the day, it gets into the space of feeling like it has enough, like it actually has a, like an abundance and enough to give up to make a human. And that's really what you want to create that space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said about sur- surviving versus thriving, because I use that analogy all the time, all the time, like you're either in one or the other. That's and it. If you're mostly spending your time in survival, your body's like, yeah, I don't really have extra to give to mm-hmm. a parasite human that I'm going to grow. <laughs> so well, that's yeah, it. Absolutely. I think safety, right? Someone asked me recently, what's your number one tip for egg quality? And I said, safety. And, uh, you know, I did a post on it and it was, I got a lot of 
negative feedback in there. Like, oh, oh if that was just so easy, you know, da, 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 like from, you know, the consumer type, you know, yeah. or the, the women that are following me, like, but what do you mean by safety? And I'm like, it's same as you said of, of what your body needs to feel is like, oh, this isn't so hard. And I have enough, like, and I have enough energy to get through my day and I feel well rested and I feel hydrated and I feel fed and I feel nourished and I feel supported. And I don't just feel like I'm running from place to place to place and just like barely getting by, you know, cause that's that, again, that is creating that sense of, you know, discomfort and disharmony in the body where it's, it's just not going to prioritize pregnancy. So getting our bodies into that, that feeling of being nourished and being safe. And I think too, you know, I was thinking about our, our, our tips that we were going to talk about here today. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things that, that I really think about that is underestimated when it comes to quality of eggs and sperm is, is that sense of, um, safety, of course, but reducing emotional inflammation, like how much is stress and your thoughts playing a role in creating an inflammatory process in your body, which is also oxidizing things and creating poor egg quality mm -hmm. and sperm health. Let's talk about that. Cause that's yeah. super interesting to me. Uh, so you said your thoughts and emotions are impacting egg quality as far as I'm aware, there's not a ton of research in this. Am I correct on that? Totally. I don't but think. But it's I mean, also I think, like we see it and we know it's yeah. happening. So let's, it's okay so that there's research. Where I research. think the research is, like, so I talked about it in my book, Body Belief. I, I get into what I call emotional inflammation quite a bit. Um, and that book was is very much directed towards autoimmune population. It was meant to be a book specifically for autoimmune and how it's impacting fertility, but mm -hmm. um that's not what the publishers totally wanted. So anyway, but I still use that same premise in, in kind of everything I do and teach. And that, you know, the, the basic uh, description is your body hears everything your brain says. We also know that our thoughts actually dictate neurological and physiological functioning. Yeah. And so creating that pattern, if you will, like we could break it down simply to that fight or flight pathway or that rest, relax, reproduce pathway, right? In the nervous system, there's kind of two choices that the, the body has on a regular basis. And so what are your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, where, which, which pathway are they putting you in? Mm -hmm. And we can also see in the research, we'll see it a lot in, if you look, if you are, if you're a research nerd, like I think you and I are, <laughs> um, researching placebo and nocebo effects is actually where you're going to find the data. Um, oh, there's another book too called the biology of belief oh, by, yeah. um, epic. what's his name? I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but, um, Lipman or something. Is that it's not Lipman? That's Frank Lipman. Um, uh, Bruce. Bruce? Bruce Lipton, Lipton. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was um, close. <laughs> yeah, you were close. I'm like, not Lipton, that's Frank. Um, but that so The Biology epic. of Belief like such is a, such a great book. Such and a great and book. so there, there's that book. Um, there's, like I said, placebo research. There's another woman, Lisa something. She wrote a whole book on, it's, it, it, I quote her in Body Belief, but it, oh, I'm not remembering the, um, the exact name of the book, but what, what they see in, in that level of research. So it's kind of like in psychology research, neuroscience research is when people believe something is actually going to be better for them or help them or bring peace or, you know, whatever, heal them, cure them. There's this sense of, I think, safety that comes over the body and their, their health outcomes shift as if, They've taken this thing that is healing them, even if they were given a sugar pill. So, I mean, that's what we're kind of seeing from, from that research perspective versus the other side. If they think something's going to be harmful to them, um, same thing that like, then you might see things worsen. My spiritual teacher also always says, if you think something's going to, is good for you, um, it's a lot better for you than if you think something's bad for you, right? So like the, the thoughts we then take that in with, Deepak Chopra gets into some of this too. That's more like the quantum physics part. But even if we're just still looking at like hard psychology or neuroscience research, you can see in, in the placebo and nocebo research that our, our thoughts, I mean, and there's another thing too, our thoughts dictate our behaviors, our behaviors dictate our health. And so 
same way too. If our thoughts are like, well, nothing's going to help me get pregnant. I'm a lost cause, like screw it. You know, so we're just going to make any, any choice that we want to make, not necessarily supportive, not necessarily tuned in, not necessarily nourishing versus, oh, you know, the research shows that when I eat 40% fat, my egg quality improves, right? Then we're making these choices that feel really supportive to ourselves. That actually is very calming to the nervous system and does put the body into this fight or flight. I mean, out of the fight or flight and into this rest, relax and reproduce mindset or, or space. So I think you could even then take that one step further and argue of like, so if I just did things that I thought were really good for myself, would that then ultimately improve my overall health? And Probably. Yeah. But then you have to fight kind of all the, the societal norms, if you will, too. You're like, we're always looking for social proof as well of like, is this thing that I'm going to do going to help me get there? And so we're, we build up this evidence, if you will. And that's kind mm-hmm. of how our beliefs are. Our beliefs are literally just thoughts that we think that we, then we seek out the evidence for it. But so anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but, but basically saying though, that the, the thoughts we think and they dictate our actions, which dictate our health, but they also dictate neurological and physiological responses in the body, which can lead to inflammatory, negative inflammatory responses, right? We all need some inflammation and or healing responses in the body. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So it's like oxidative it. stress, right? That's another thing too. If you want to just like Google oxidative stress and egg quality, you know, I mean, that's what all the research is about. And what is the number one thing that causes oxidative stress in our bodies? Inflammation. Inflammation, but stress, you know what I mean? Oh, so yeah, putting definitely. the body in a stressful environment. And so, but your stress is different than my stress, right? You know what I mean? Like what your threshold is different than mine. So, so we're all very different beings. And so like, I, you know, I, I hate saying to women, oh, I think stress is playing a role here. Cause that's, it's kind of offensive. It's like, well, who doesn't have stress in their lives, but, <laughs> but everybody's level or ability to manage it or their body or their nervous system's ability to snap back. Maybe they've had previous traumas that were much more significant than like you or I had as a child. And so that triggers this huge trauma response, floods their body with inflammatory you know, particles. And so their oxidative stress loads are much higher than, than other people too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, wow, that's a really good breakdown of all of the components that are leading to whether we're moving closer to the optimal fertile state or moving away from it. Uh, it. Can we talk about sperm health for a minute? Cause I know it doesn't get as much of a yeah, um, no. as much bandwidth as, as I feel I like should. Uh, well, I think too, of like, you know, some of it is that there's millions of sperm. And yeah. as far as we know, you know, we born with millions and we slowly diminish, although there's now research that's like coming out, like right now, questioning all of that of like, we actually, there is really thought now that we actually do continue to make eggs throughout our lives. We're not just mm. born with some and they completely diminish and go away. Anyway, wow. it's fascinating research. Yeah. You can, I actually posted in my stories yesterday, so you can go and look, um, but sperm does impact, you know, I think, I think the number now we're all talking about is about 50% of fertility challenges are actually male factor related. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think some could argue even more. Yeah. Uh, but Sperm also, I suppose, is we're told can turn over more quickly than eggs, right? We have about a three month, 100 day window for folliculogenesis to really impact egg quality. Sperm, we could do it less than that, 50 to 70 days. You know, I think we can make significant impacts even in a month with, with making some simple changes to sperm health, just because there's also so many of them that we don't need all of them to improve. You know, we, we need just kind of percentages. We're really yeah. dealing with the percentages. And they're, they're on different cycles. So it's not yes. like we get rid of the millions that we have, and then we have a new load of millions. They're yeah. just that different stages of development. So, That's exactly it. Yeah. So it's like you can influence those those younger ones, if you will, or the immature ones. Mm-hmm. But similar, I think, to folliculogenesis, that we're we're impacting the the applicant pool that's going to be ovulated in about three months. You know, we're going mm-hmm. back to that like early stage. Um, what primordial, I suppose, is, is the word for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so anyway, with sperm, I think it's very similar. Like like environmental toxins, I think, are playing a tremendous role in sperm health. So we're thinking about like pesticides. We're thinking about toxins in Bath and Beauty products. Um, I also think 
lifestyle significantly impacts sperm, you know, smoking, drinking, that type of thing, but even, you know, tight underpants and where you're carrying your phone and your laptop sitting on your lap, all of these things are impacting sperm. So we want to, we always, I always want to think about like heat and how that's impacting sperm Mm -hmm. because it's such a tight container and we want to kind of make sure things are breathing down there and circulating properly. Um, And then of course, you know, we know important nutrients like zinc and selenium and, you know, our omegas, vitamin D. So, You know, what I tend to do is if I'm dealing with a woman in, you know, a heterosexual partnership and we are using his sperm to try to make a baby, I try to get them to just adopt the same lifestyle as much as we can, right? That we're still focused on um, a lot of the men that, you know, and including my own husband, they do really well with like, here's your greens powder, like superfood green powder. I want you to have like a scoop of this a day. I want you to be taking like three grams of fish oil a day get your vitamin D up, have some Brazil nuts, you know, like there's a couple, like they need just a couple pumpkin seeds, a couple real specific mm-hmm. things. Yeah. And, um, it does and seem to, go sh- do it. they'll do it. They'll do yeah. it. Cut back your alcohol. You know, um, I think it depends. Alcohol is such a touchy subject for, for very obvious reasons. And, um, mm-hmm. I by no means push it, but I think a lot of people like it as part of their life. And so I, I work with them then on choices. Like what's our better choices. If we're going to choose alcohol, can we find organic, uh, versions of alcohol, really clean versions of alcohol? And can we limit our consumption? You know, so kind of getting away from like the beer or like the dark rums or stuff like that. And it's like really good organic wine. Can you keep it to a couple glasses a week? You know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Or if you're going to go out Friday and Saturday, okay. So like, here's two and two, you know, keeping it at four. Um, so I, I try with men, you know, who are choosing to consume, I think in a, in a safe and healthy way, you know, five drinks a week, if we can do that, if we have sperm issues. Um, but there's also the semen analysis. What is it done once sometimes in the very beginning of the process, <gasps> it's also is really that, upsetting. Yeah, if that. <laughs> so I push for more semen analysis, I'll push mm-hmm. for DNA fragmentation. And the other thing I'll say though, is like, listen, even if your sperm looks good, something's not happening. Like egg and sperm aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So I still want to work on improving sperm because there's no harm in having even better sperm, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll always do like a good antioxidant formula for for the the males and good fish oil, you know, get their vitamin D status checked. I mean, I had one, one guy recently, you know, everything was seemingly normal, but when we ran labs, his thyroid was severely out of whack. And it was actually his thyroid condition His sperm, his semen analysis still looked pretty normal, Mm -hmm. but addressing that, getting him on thyroid medication, actually, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Then we we wound up making a healthy baby. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, she was fine, actually. But I've had so many cases where, um, you know, nobody's pushing for a semen analysis. They wind up coming to me. Now they're a year and a half into their journey. And okay, can we look at sperm? And sure enough, like I've had guys just not have any sperm. They have ejaculate. There's no sperm in it. Oh, well, that's not, we're definitely not going to make a baby. So sorry (laughs) that we had a year and a half of trying that no one's looked at that. That's upsetting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's super upsetting. And it's also like the number of times guys are told, oh, your sperm are great and totally fine. And this guy, one of these couples that was, that I was talking to, the guy had 0% spermophilogy. Yep. 0% sperm morphology. And I was like, and he's like, yeah, my doctor said it's fine. And we're going to get pregnant naturally. I'm like, no way. Like, I don't care if you have 300 million sperm. If 0% are normal, then it's not going to work. No way it's going to happen. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's another important thing to look at with, with semen analysis is how many are we dealing with? And then what's the percentage motility morphology, right? Because sometimes a guy might have 300 million sperm and his morphology is poor. But then mm-hmm. if you do the math, he actually has better, more good ones than a guy with, you know, 300,000 mm-hmm. sperm, right? right. And decent yeah. morphology. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing that I feel like isn't often really broken down. But I am a big fan of the DNA fragmentation test because I mm-hmm. think 
um, it's especially for some for those that need the data to support the changes. Some don't. Some mm -hmm. just are going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, my my approach doesn't typically change with the DNA fragmentation, but it, it does. It looks deeper into sperm and how it could be potentially um, impacting overall embryo health. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that inflammation has impact in men just as much as women? Yeah, totally, 100%. Yeah. yeah, so what kind of markers do you see or do you test guys for inflammation in some way to figure out if that's- Yeah, you, you know, I'll look at um, their like CBC and then I'll ask for, you know, uh, homocysteine levels, CRP, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of depends on presentation. So a lot of times how I do it is, is typically the woman's coming to me, then I will spend time asking about the partner, the partner's health. If, if there is like, oh, he's got this, or he has this autoimmune condition, or he has, you know, this the really bad GI stuff, or he has really bad allergies or that kind of thing, then I'll say, because typically they're, they're buying like a package of sessions with me. I'm, I say, you know, I want a half hour with your husband. I need, you know, he has to book it. Here's my link. And I get on the call with him and then I'll do my full intake and then I'll get blood work. Like I just had a guy who I did a GI map on actually, because he had all this GI stuff. And sure enough, I mean, gluten, dairy. So like, he was just like his, his, his GI was a mess and we put him on yeah. a protocol. I mean, we are not, actively trying because she had to get a fibroid removed right now but like uh, i guarantee you like his pre and post semen analysis from from just doing that and healing him first mm -hmm. of all his quality of life he's so much happier like right. he didn't even want to have sex half the time because he felt so bloated and gross all the time right mm -hmm. so even just that like regardless yeah. if i see the markers shift on labs or in his semen analysis they're just a happier couple now because he's happier in his body and we've like but so that's typically how I do it. So similar though, with, with any woman of like, I want a complete thyroid panel, complete iron panel, CBC. I want to look at inflammatory markers, vitamin D status, right. And make sure we're doing, we're all the things are in line. That's how I found that one guy's thyroid, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. He didn't really yeah. have any complaints, but yeah. I just said, I need to see his recent labs. And so sometimes they come to me, they already have labs and I'm going to look through and then I'm going to repeat. Sure. Um, but Chinese medicine, you know, and I know you're, you're naturopathy, so you, you get it too, of like, we're really good. That's where that detective piece comes in. Like, we just look for symptoms of inflammation. And then I just kind of want to see those change. And sometimes the labs change, sometimes they don't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow, this is so good. And I love that we have such a shared approach in terms of how, like, how we're thinking about things, right? Like yeah. surviving and thriving. Are you surviving or are you thriving? And what are the things that are keeping you from being in thrive mode? It sounds mm -hmm. like you do the same kind of digging, which I think is is rare. Yes. I, and I don't understand it, but it's rare. Um, so I appreciate so much what you're doing. Uh, Thank you. Is there, uh, if if you're, if we're to like leave our, our listeners with, one or two things that you want every single person listening to this to walk away with, what would that be? That you can improve egg health and sperm health, even as you get older, that age is not the only determining factor in your fertility, mm -hmm. nor are your numbers, right? Yeah. You know, I'm just like you, I, I've seen women with really low AMH, really high FSH. Mm -hmm. I've seen I've seen men with really poor semen analysis, you know, and they, they, they make babies, you know, so to not, um, not let those test results define you know that you can shift them, that you can improve them. And also never underestimate too. I mean, I think this is a big one for all the girls doing fertility treatments and IVF that if you're doing all the things and you're still not getting the results that you think you should be getting or the, you know, embryo quality or the outcome that it might not be you, it might be the medication and the protocol your doctor has you on. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. don't ever forget to question that or mm -hmm. to get a second and even a third opinion because I can't tell you how many cases I've seen where they come to me and I'm like, girl, all you need to do is actually not take 450 Follistim for eight <laughs> days. And they're like, wait, what? You know, and I'm like, yeah, no this is, this is not a more is better game. You know, it's right. less is more is typically um, where it's at. So I think that's another really important thing to think about. Like I just, 
now, now this is another side point, but like, I just had a woman who was like, okay, we just did our seventh transfer, still didn't take, I'm now six years older. I'm 39. The doctors are just saying, everything's right. It's your age. It's your egg quality. And I'm like, if you've done seven transfers and you haven't implanted, it is not egg quality. It's something's wrong with the uterine environment. You need to look inside that uterus. Have yes. you had a hysteroscopy? Have you done an endometriitis test? Like, no, there's some, like the uterus, something's up with the uterus. It is not the quality of the eggs. You know, so it just, I almost would say like, don't take no for an answer. Just keep searching. If there's a desire for a child, there's a child that wants to come through and you, you just, you unfortunately have to do a lot of the work on your own sometimes to connect those dots, but um, yeah, keep listening to resources like this too. And, and I think whatever like lights up for you, like, huh, I didn't think about that and follow that and follow that, you know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good. I love it. I could, I could just keep picking your brain for hours, oh, but thanks. I appreciate you being here and sharing all of your wisdom and the stories of all of these couples that you're working with that, have experiences i like they sound a lot like the stories i hear so yes i know that there are a lot of people having similar experiences as they're going through their journeys and i appreciate what you said about like don't keep doing the same thing over and over again yeah. go find someone else to have a different view on this because you uh, the worst <laughs> i'm sorry i'm about to go on a tangent the worst case thing that I've ever heard, 12 IVF cycles with the same doctor this couple yeah. had been through. And she's like 28, 12 cycles. And they're telling her, oh, it's your age. It's egg quality. I'm like, bullshit. Like yeah. something is really off if they yeah. need to do 12 IVF cycles. So 100%. I just, it's not the right fit. Then we have to keep yeah. looking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and she's like, it just, it drives me crazy that these women are just getting caught up in this as like, oh, well, I just need to do more cycles because that right. will work. And I'm like, well, at the point at which you've done so many, I think it's time to find Not a so different much. approach. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I appreciate what you said. And I hope that our listeners are walking away with like, this is in your power. Mm -hmm. Yes, it sucks that you have to go and seek it out, but know that there is support out there. Yes. Yeah, love it. Thank you so love much it. for being here with us. Thank today. you so much for having me. Where Where is the best place for people to connect with you? I think on Instagram, that's where I'm the okay. most active. TikTok as well. I'm really having a lot of fun on TikTok lately. Oh, cool. So either I either one of those. Follow you yeah. on TikTok too. And just, you know, at my name, my handle, Amy Ralph, and awesome. that's where you can find me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So we'll link that in the show notes and we will we'll look forward to hearing all your amazing tips for the rest of this week. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Was that an amazing episode or what? Make sure to check our show notes so that you can link up with our guests. And if you're not a part of our secret Fertile AF community, you can join for free via the link in our show notes. Last but not least, have you showed us some love lately? It would mean the world to us if you could share and review our podcast. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Egg Meets Sperm. Peace.